biochemist Fuzz Rana is Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe. Fuzz earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at West Virginia State University and a PhD in Chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry at Ohio University. He pursued postdoctoral studies in the biophysics of cell membranes at the universities of Virginia and Georgia. Though he initially embraced the evolutionary paradigm, Fuzz eventually drew the conclusion that only a creator's involvement could explain the elegance of biochemical systems. Please welcome Fuzz Rama. Well, good morning, everybody. You know, I don't know what Michael was talking about because Hugh and Kathy said I have 45 minutes. <laughs> so I just have time to burn up here. <laughs> just kidding, of course. Um, have any of you known somebody who suffered from a stroke or maybe from a traumatic brain injury? You know, uh, those types of events in a person's life, of course, are, are horrifying, not only for the patient, but for friends and family members. And I remember when I was uh, in college, my father suffered the first of his two strokes. Thankfully, the first stroke was really mild and, and left very little impact on him. You wouldn't even know that he had suffered a stroke other than he was slightly weakened on his left side. But it was a frightening experience. But a number of years later, he suffered a second stroke and he wasn't so lucky. He was de it decimated him physically but tragically, it, it impacted his mental capabilities. And this was really very sad, uh, particularly for me, because my father was the most brilliant person I've ever known. He was a nuclear physicist, a college professor. In fact, he was an intimidating person because of his intellectual power. And it was really very frustrating for him, and it was very sad for us to see my father uh, finish his life in that way. And maybe that's why I'm drawn to the story of Rosemary Johnson. Maybe some of you have heard of Rosemary's story. Rosemary Johnson was a promising classical musician. Uh, in 1988, she was 19 years old, and she had earned a seat in the Welsh National Opera Orchestra as a second violinist. And on the way to a performance, was involved in an automobile accident. And that left her in a coma for seven months. And then after coming out of the coma, she was unable to move and unable to speak. She was locked in, trapped in her own mind. And that's how Rosemary Johnson has lived her life since that tragic day. But things are changing for Rosemary Johnson. Thanks to work done by Eduardo Miranda, who's a neuroscientist uh, at Plymouth University in the United Kingdom. Uh, Edward Miranda is... Uh, collaborating with a team of researchers from the Royal Hospital for Neurodisabilities in London, and they've launched something called the Brain Computer Interface Project. Uh, check that the Brain Computer Music Interface Project. And the idea behind this project is to use modified EEG caps to, to detect the electrical activity of the patient's from the patient's brain, and then to train the patient to use their brain electrical activity to control computer software that allows them to select notes and musical phrases so that they can compose music. In fact, if a musician is able to see a mirror of their screen, they can actually direct the performance of that musician. In fact, Eduardo Miranda has formed something that he's called the Paramusical Ensemble, which is a collaboration of four quadriplegic patients who were locked in, like Rosemary Johnson, in the Bergeson String Quartet. And they will travel around the United Kingdom performing at musical festivals, showing off this emerging technology. And as you can imagine, this is incredibly transformative for these types of patients. And the reason why Eduardo Miranda chose music as the means to communicate is because music not only allows the communication of ideas, it allows the communication of emotions and feelings, which is so very important for patients who are locked in. And I would like to show you a short clip of uh, Rosemary Johnson directing the performance of a musician who she played with in the Welsh National Opera Orchestra. 
The first voice you're going to hear on this clip is that of neuroscience Eduardo Miranda. So let's watch this clip. You know, it took 20 years. It would not have been achieved if I had not the chance to work with Rosie. The idea of playing with Rosie again after so many years was something I never imagined would be possible. I must have seen this uh, video 25 times and, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> I tear up every time. What a wonderful use of technology. And I'm more convinced than ever that people are made in God's image watching this video clip. Just seeing the way that Rosemary Johnson responded to being able to communicate through music, the image of God was just unleashed. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are incredible advances that are happening in computer brain interface technology. For example, a team of researchers at UC Berkeley a number of years ago developed mathematical algorithms that allow them to convert electrical activity in a patient's brain into words that can be displayed in software packages. And to do this, they piggybacked on a pre-surgical procedure that is done for epileptic patients before um, ep uh, surgery where they will go in and kill part of the brain that's actually responsible for the seizures, they have to very carefully map out brain function. So these researchers wired up these patients with 256 electrodes and then monitored the electrical activity as the patients engaged in conversation as they read uh, out loud and then read to themselves. And in fact, just recently, a team of researchers published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where they used computer brain interface technology to allow an ALS patient who is locked in to communicate it with words through, again, software, computer software. Computer brain interface technology is uh, impacting uh, the lives of amputee patients as well. We're developing the ability to uh, produce rather sophisticated prosthetic limbs. And with computer brain interface technology, patients can learn to control the movement of these robotic limbs with their thoughts. In fact, they can even develop a sense of ownership of that limb. This is an incredible example of technology 
that is used for good. But yet, tragically, there is a dark side to this technology. And to appreciate that dark side, we need to consider something known as transhumanism. How many of you in here know what transhumanism is? A few people. I'm, I find that most people don't know what transhumanism is. This is a movement that began in the 1960s. It's a scientific and philosophical movement that was largely viewed as a fringe idea until about four or five years ago, where this idea is now rapidly moving into the mainstream in academia among scientists, technologists, and philosophers. And the idea behind transhumanism is that we are to develop and employ technology to enhance human beings beyond our biological capabilities. That through technology, we can enhance our physical abilities, our intellectual abilities, and our emotional uh, states. That technology can be used to overcome our weaknesses as human beings. That technology can be used to transcend and supersede our biological limitations. But there's more than just human enhancement that's part of transhumanism. Transhumanism takes on a religious nature and character because transhumanists now view this idea that they ha we have as human beings through technology total control over our destiny as a human species and that through technology we can actually evolve humanity into an ensemble of post-human species that are a fusion of technology and biology. This is what James Hughes said in his book uh, Citizen Cyborg. In the 21st century, the convergence of artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and genetic engineering will allow human beings to achieve things previously imagined only in science fiction. Lifespans will extend well beyond a century. Our senses and cognition will be enhanced. We will gain control over our emotions and memory. We will merge with machines, and machines will become more like humans. These technologies will allow us to evolve into varieties of post-humans and usher us into a transhuman era and society. Human technologies, technologies that push the boundaries of humanism, can radically improve our quality of life, and we have a fundamental right to use them to control our bodies and our minds. This is what transhumanism is. But it's not just simply enhancing our, us uh, uh, human beings beyond our biological limits. It's not simply taking control of, of evolution and ushering in a post-human era. There's a desire through transhumanism to attain utopia, to extend life expectancy indefinitely and perhaps even attain immortality through uh, a post-human future. This is the grand vision of the singularity. Uh, by, espoused by Ray Kurzweil, the idea that there's going to be a merger between man and machine, if you will, and that through technology we're going to be able to upload our conscience, our minds, our essence, whatever you want to call it, into a computer framework, and in doing so, uh, not only supersede our biological limitations, but live forever. If you think this idea is science fiction, consider some other advances in computer brain interface technology. Scientists have discovered that with computer brain interfaces, they can actually uh, send uh, uh, continuous pulses into the brain of Parkinson's patients, and in doing so, actually alleviate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. This is an exciting advance. And in fact, they discovered that that same procedure, if the electrical pulses are intermittent, can actually enhance the memory and cognitive abilities of Alzheimer's patients. Now, this is interesting because we're now one step away from using computer brain interface technology to enhance the cognitive abilities of people who are not suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And if you think about now combining computer brain interface technology with Bluetooth technology, people can potentially access the World Wide Web with their thoughts. If, you, again, you think this is science fiction, I would like for you to watch this short clip from a TED Talk given by Jason Sosa, the founder and president of 
a company called Immersive. Computer chips won't just be in your laptop or in your phone. Doctors will implant them in our brains and they'll restore sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. Today, there are already 300,000 people with cochlear implants. It's a form of a neural prosthetic that allows certain types of deaf people to hear. And Michio Kaku describes brain implants as your very own augmented mind. And this is the beginning of the brain net, a possible successor to the internet, a form of virtual telepathy that will allow you to create music, drive a car, communicate with other people, and even surf the web at the speed of thought. Movies will no longer be these two-dimensional slate tablets that you look into and blast sound at you. They'll be fully immersive experiences, complete with feeling and emotion the way the director originally intended. Everything is stored, every memory recorded, and available on a cloud service. And mind uploading will allow your friends to share their digital vacation experiences that never actually took place. It all just happened in their mind. Similar to Total Recall. For people who espouse the transhumanist vision, these kind of advances make them believe that we are on the cusp of attaining the singularity. Now, this idea of transhumanism, though it's fueled by advances in neuroprosthetics and genetic engineering and things like that, is an idea that's a logical entailment of the thinking that emerged during the early days of the Enlightenment. In those days, science was being born, and people began to realize the power of science to understand the world around us and to convert that understanding into technology. And the vision was that this would make us the lords and masters of nature. Rene Descartes said this, we could know the power and action of fire, water, air, and the stars, the heavens and all other bodies in our environment as distinctly as we know the different crafts of our artisans. And we could use this knowledge as the artisans use theirs for all the purposes for which it is appropriate and thus make ourselves, as it were, the lords and masters of nature. Transhumanists are not looking to make themselves the lords and master of nature. They're looking to make themselves the lords and masters of human beings. This idea has spawned something that scholars call technofaith. The idea that science and technology is the pathway to improve not only the quality of human life, but to address the problem of evil, alleviating pain and suffering. That, that technofaith is a way for us to attain utopia and ultimately to attain immortality. That we, through science and technology, can bend the world and conform it to our desires. And this idea of techno-faith is becoming more and more prominent in our culture. In fact, it is beginning to infuse medicine itself, where medicine has undergone a transformation from being a human activity where we are trying to uh, alleviate people's pain and suffering through the medical arts, perhaps finding cures for certain diseases, to actually employing technology now to enhance human capabilities that medicine is merging with this transhumanist vision. In a sense, you could think of transhumanism as completing a materialistic worldview, making the materialistic worldview fully orbed, where the, the theory of human evolution supplants the Genesis 1 creation account for humanity, and now human destiny is supplanted scripturally with the book, from the book of Revelation with this transhumanist vision. This has become the materialistic eschatology. This has become the materialistic destiny for humanity. This represents a serious challenge to the gospel in the Christian worldview, does it not? But it's not just simply advances in computer brain interface technology that are raising uh, the possibilities of transhumanism. We are increasingly gaining control over the reproductive process. Recently, researchers developed an artificial womb that can be used to improve the outcome for premature births. And in fact, the technology will likely make it possible for premature infants to survive when born earlier than 20 weeks. 
On the other hand, you have scientists working in the lab to extend the survivability of, of embryos created through in vitro fertilization in a laboratory setting. And when these two technologies overlap, it's going to be conceivable that human beings will, and human reproduction will happen in a laboratory from conception through birth. We have advances in genetic engineering, the CRISPR-Cas9 advances, that potentially offer us the opportunity to treat a number of uh, debilitating genetic disorders, maybe even eliminate genetic disorders from the human gene pool, but at the same time, this could also be used for human enhancement technology. We have a stem cell technology that allows us to replace damaged tissues with stem cells. Uh, restoring lost function to tissues that otherwise would not be able to regenerate. And yet the same technology can be used to extend human life expectancy and maybe enhance human capabilities. There are advances happening in pharmaceutical work where we're developing drugs that can enhance our cognition, enhance our memory, and even enhance our physical strength. And there's so many questions that begin to swirl as we think about these emerging technologies that are in service to this transhumanist vision. Questions that are ethical in nature, philosophical in nature, and theological in nature that can be summarized in a single question, should we play God? As Christians, we are going to have to engage this idea in the years to come. And we don't have the option of just simply condemning this technology because the technology can be used for enormous amount of good. We can't just simply attack it or we can't act like I've seen some Christians act as if this isn't going to really happen because it is happening. And so we can't withdraw from our culture. We've got to engage our culture with the Christian worldview and with the gospel. And there are three ways that I think we can engage uh, this idea of transhumanism with the Christian worldview that actually helps to uh, advance the Christian worldview within our culture. One is to help address the ethical concerns associated with this emerging biotechnology. And I don't have time to get into the details this morning, uh, but suffice it to say that the Christian worldview is unique and actually providing the motivation to pursue biotechnology advances, while at the same time putting in place the appropriate safeguards that ensure that human beings are not exploited and human life isn't devalued. What I'd like to do in the time that I have remaining is focus on the next two points. And this has to do more closely with how we can present the gospel in a, in a, in a post-human world or a world where there's a vision towards post-humanism. And the first is that we have to demonstrate to people that techno-faith and transhumanism is a counterfeit gospel. And once we do that, we need to show what is the connection between the transhumanism dream and the hope that the gospel represents. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to show that techno-faith is a, a counterfeit gospel. All we have to do is read a little bit about the history of technology and the philosophy of technology, and we recognize right away that technology is never the panacea. It never solves problems. It only creates new problems where those problems didn't exist. Technology is a double-edged sword, and it might alleviate some pain and suffering. It might improve the quality of life for human beings in one area, but it almost always detracts from the quality of life in other areas. It almost always uh, leads to unintended consequences. The pain and suffering that technology addresses usually displaces it someplace else. Technology can be used for good, it can be used for bad, but the unintended consequences always undermine the impact that technology can have. Brent Waters says this with regard to the Industrial Revolution. The science which had promised to liberate humans from the shackles of superstition and fossilized tradition was instead serving as a cruel taskmaster. Philosopher David Curtis we create technologies to liberate us from the problems of physical labor. But these technologies inevitably create the unique problems of living in a technological society rife with pollution, psychological stress, and bureaucratic coldness. Each technology both giveth and taketh away. 
Despite our good intentions, all technologies manifest harmful side effects. And in spite of our bad intentions, even our most destructive inventions may be re-engineered for good. By adding to our lives, technologies by necessity also subtract from them. The more powerful a technology is, the more devastating the unintended consequences will be. And when we start talking about engineering humanity to create post-human species, we could very well create a dystopian future, uh, which none of us would want to live in. In fact, we might even drive ourselves to extinction. This is the concern of many thinkers as they think about this idea of post-humanism. But as Ronald Cold Turner says, technology can lead us to the erroneous notion that the only problems to which it is worth paying attention involve engineering. When, when we let this happen, we reduce human yearning for salvation to a mere desire for enhancement, a lesser salvation that we can control rather than the true salvation for which, for which we must also wait. Transhumanism and technofaith are counterfeit gospel. But then how do we build a bridge between transhumanism and the Christian gospel. This is where I think we have an unprecedented opportunity to engage our culture unlike any time in human history. I don't view transhumanism as a threat, I view it as an opportunity. Why would I say that? Because oftentimes I find skeptics will use scientific discoveries as a, an excuse to deny God's existence or deny the reliability of scripture and in doing so, erect a wall that separates them from the gospel. What's happening with transhumanism is science and technology are decimating that wall and exposing the need that we all have as human beings for the hope that the gospel represents. Transhumanists are motivated ultimately by a desire to connect to the transcendent. They recognize that death is in a natural state. They want to see a utopia. They want to have meaning and purpose and destiny to their lives. And this is exactly what the, the gospel offers us, that hope. Ronald Cole Turner says this, There are notable similarities between Christianity and transhumanism. Christians hope for eternal life that will be enjoyed with the fullest possible knowledge, joy, and moral purity. Transhumanists look forward to extending the human lifespan, perhaps indefinitely, while also enriching human knowledge, attaining greater happiness, if not joy, and achieving moral balance and social harmony. One explanation for these similarities is that transhumanism emerged from a culture shaped by Christianity. Another is that the yearning Christians and transhumanists feel if not quite universally shared by all human beings, are broadly held and find their own expression in both contexts. Transhumanism is an amazing opportunity for us to build a bridge to the gospel. And so we need to engage this idea. We need to be aware of this idea and know how to respond to it, not by condemning the technology, not by avoiding it, but by engaging it with the gospel. And I'm going to close with this one um, final thought, and that is this. That at the end of the day, Christianity is in fact transhumanism. <laughs> the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another the sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. The stars differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is the hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you.